What's up tribe? How you guys doing? Go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I hope you like this video. This is another retro review. We have the view. Mm -mm, uh, the view. Oh no, the wire. Oh, where did I get that from? <laughs> the wire season two, episode two. So listen, this episode, you listen, this is this episode lets you know that we are setting up for an, a season of chess. There will be no checkers being played this season. It is all the chess game. We have a couple of things going on. One, we have the chess game of figuring out who's going to be responsible for these 14 dead bodies that they found in that cargo ship, okay? Two, we have the chess game of who is going to get their window put in that daggone church, okay? And then we have the third chess game, which is a smaller, smaller, smaller chess game because we still got to keep Avon in the loop. They still tell the Avon story, even though the majority of this season is really going to focus on what's going on down at the docks. But we'll see how it all collides. So we start off with we have all the local Baltimore agencies trying to figure out who these dead bodies belong to. And it was really sad to hear them arguing about why these women, like, even to the point where they were like, well, they're just cargo. We don't have any ID. Like, they're not bodies. They're cargo. And it was just, it was really sad. But what ended up happening was the bodies ended up staying with the, that local unit that the, um, the, the, the lady who was driving around, I get her name, but with her unit, that's who it ended up staying with. Um... And it was so anyway, but we're gonna we're gonna see where it ends up, okay? Um, no, actually, um, yeah. What did it end up? Anyway, it ended up somewhere else. Okay, we're gonna get there. I think it was anyway, because it bounced around a couple of times, y'all. Let me hold on. Give me a second. Yeah, it ends up staying with her. Okay, so then we see, um. Frank go and um, he go confront the Greek. Really, it's not the Greek. It's really the Greeks in the mediary. Um, and he was like, why didn't you tell me what was going on with these cargo ships? Why didn't you tell me what the what the cargo was? And, you know, he was like, you got these dead bodies, you know, on my dock and you don't tell me about it. I, basically, there were women dying at the bottom of that cargo ship and you didn't tell me anything about it. And he was like, um, first of all, now you care about what's in them cargo ships? Like, you ain't been caring as long as you were getting paid. And he was like, and, and it was funny, it sort of stopped him in his tracks. He was like, mm. well, next time, just let me know if there's some, something breathing on my ship. Like, I need to know. You're leaving me exposed. And he was like, yeah, all right, then. But he tells them, listen, your boy ran. Like, your boy showed up. He was there, and then he left. Like, what was going on? But come to find out, he didn't get the signal he was supposed to get. There's a signal that lets him know it's all everything is all good. He didn't get the signal. That's what he was standing out there in the rain waiting for. Never got the signal. So he rolled out. Um, we'll get back to that because that's a whole nother situation, child. We'll get back to that. Then we have um Dee's mama going to visit Avon. Let her let Avon know what's going on on the other side. And she brings him up to speed on what happened with Roberto and how Stringer had to meet with the lawyer, how Roberto ain't really trying to mess with them right now. They're a little hot. Send them their money back. And so it really ain't a whole lot Avon could say because he gave him his money back, but he was just like, so dang, they really not going to mess with us like that? She was like, yeah. She said that we are barely holding on. Like, we dry. And so she said, we got one person that we can go talk to down in Atlanta. But Stringer's going to have to get on a plane and go handle it. And so, you know, um, Avon, no, actually, Avon told her that. So she was like, all right, it's going to be handled. She said, but how's D doing? And, you know, he was like, I mean... I guess he all right. I really ain't seen him. And she was like, listen, you're going to have to do better. Promises were made. Like, he carrying a whole lot of weight for us. And basically, she ain't never tell her brother how close he came to flipping on everybody. I'm, I'm assuming. 
And, you know, basically, as far as Avon knows, she was able to convince him, you know, to keep his mouth shut. But she was, but she know he right here, right here. And, you know, the baby's not, you know, his baby mama not bringing the baby to come and visit him. They not taking care of her like they supposed to be taking care of her. And Avon was like, you right, you right. He was like, I was slipping. You know, some promises were made. I need to, I need to handle it. I need to do what I need to do. Um... He's like, we'll get Stringer. Stringer's going to go see the baby mama. He's going to go visit her. And I'll check on D. Okay? Okay. Now, back down to the docks. We see good old Carver. We didn't see Carver last episode. When we kind of got the, the up-to-date on everybody, we didn't get the up-to-date on Carver. Well, Carver is out there writing tickets. And I said, why is this sergeant writing tickets? Well, he's working under um, Pres Belusky's father-in-law. And you know he's trying to get his window in that church, and he's got a—he's pissed off at the union, and he sent the, the 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 officers down there to basically write tickets. He was like, "Listen, you know, write tickets any violation that they can find." So dude comes running out there. He was like, "Why are y'all bothering us?" He was like, "We've been parking here for years. Like, why all of a sudden is it a violation?" He said, "Look, I just follow. I'm just following orders. I got to work today. I was told to come down here, pay for this whole street. That's what I have to do." He was like, if you got a problem, you can go take it to my boss. Just leave my name out of it. But, dude, it's a chain of command. I'm just following my chain of command, okay? But, of course, we know it all goes back to this damn glass window. It goes back. Listen, this whole thing gets pumped off of a, of a stained glass window, child. We get there. We get there. So, back down to the jail, one of the COs is hassling WeeBay. And come to find out. Weebay killed one of his family members. And so, dude is, you know, taking it out on Weebay. And, a you know, Weebay goes to Avon and was like, yo, tell, dude gonna have to let up. Like, I, like I'm gonna do my time. Like, I ain't tripping. But, like, he ain't there bothering me. You know, he was like, he killed my fish. Like, he ain't had to bother my fish. I was like, really, Weebay? But we know how Weebay feel about his fish. Remember his whole fish tank situation he had before he went to Philly? Um, but it ended up being a whole situation. And Avon was like, well, you know, I'll handle it, you know. Um, and Avon tried to talk to the CO. The CO basically told Avon to kiss his ass because, you know, they killed one of his family members. And now he got a little bit of authority over them. He was like, I ain't scared of you or your operation because he probably think that Avon ain't got no legs since he in, the, in jail. He ain't got no way. Of, he can't spread his wings. Okay. Now back down to the docks. Um... Press Walewski's uh, father-in-law goes to visit the union. And, of course, they have the whole, you know, who's this bigger match. And, you know, he tells him, he was like, you know, and, and the guy, Frank even was like, so, like, you really mad over, like, you really mad over this over this window? Like, that's all you, all you had to do was ask. Like, if you wanted the window, all you had to do was ask. He was like, well, you going to give it to me? He was like, no, no, I'm not going to give it to you. But, like, all of this, you, you know, you hassling us over a window like we don't bother nobody. And come to find out, they have a history. They know each other from the neighborhood. They grew up together. Because, you know, one of those types of situations where they're all, you know, Irish Catholics. They all, well, not Irish. They're Pol Polish Catholics. So they all go to the same church. They went to the same elementary school. Like, they all know each other. And come to find out, you know, he was like the nerd in school. You know what I'm saying? He was the nerd. Um, and now he got a little bit of authority and he wants that damn window and he's going to have for the union. Um, McNulty goes to visit Bunk. And of course, everybody down there is pissed off at, at McNulty because you know what he did with that floater with the dead body. And come to find out, that's when McNulty gets a window of the 13 bodies. And, um, you know, Bunk was like, listen. You just don't know how to stay out of trouble. Like, you can't just, he said, you know, you can't just keep your head down and just and just do what you got to do. He was like, oh, what more can they do to me? Like, they already got me on the docks. Like, it ain't really more they can do to me. So, it is what it is. Like, basically, every chance I get to fuck them, I'm going to do it. So, he goes down um, to go visit um, down to the docks to go talk to the local agency who got stuck with the 13 bodies. And he goes to talk to them. And he's like, listen... Let me go, you know, 
let me see what, what you found in the body. So he, he, you know, she said they suffocated. He's like, let me go see for myself. So he goes and investigates and he realizes that this wasn't an accident. It doesn't look like the way, because the way they thought was that one of the, that somebody put um, a crate on top of that, that one, which cut off the, the air supply. But he was like, no, this wasn't no accident. Like this was intentionally done. These are murders. This isn't an accidental death. And now, now it's a, now it's an actual case. And um, he was like, you know, I actually have a floater. And he's looking through the belongings and come to find out. He was like, she said, well, we did find fourteen IDs. Well, fifteen IDs. We only got fourteen bodies. She was like, huh. So they end up making the connection that the body they found floating in the water was the um the girl and she's connected to all of them so of course mcnulty gets that information what does mcnulty do he puts together one of his infamous little um reports and he faxes it in and then the McNulty's old boss, um, oh shoot, what's his name? Lieutenant Major Rawls, Major Rawls, Major Rawls. Major Rawls ends up getting into it with the other major from the county, and they're going back and forth over the body. And Rawls is able to convince them that that body don't belong, that those bodies don't belong to him. He was like, listen, if you stick me with 14 unsolved, like Jane Doe's, like that's going to take my, my, you know, my murder rate like below 50%, my unsolved rate below 50%. Like we ain't trying to have that. He was like, those bodies belong to you. This is where they went off the ship. That, you know, they died at T at XYZ time. They belong to you. Well, once McNulty faxes in his little uh, report, honey, guess who they belong to now? They belong to Rawls. And the other dude ended up getting stuck with the case. The the white guy that um, had the case before. And so they all end up going drinking that night. You got um, Freeman, you got Bunk, and you got McNulty. They, why did they make McNulty take 14 shots for each body? Listen, I was like, y'all are lucky that that man didn't get no daggone um, alcohol poisoning. 14 shots? And they were laughing because even though they got stuck with the bodies, they personally didn't get the bodies. The other guy got the bodies. And they were like, as long as they don't end up on my sheet, I'm good. You know, they were like, that's messed up what you did, Big Nulty. That's real. You know, that's real effed up what you did, Big Nulty. And, of course, they were all laughing and joking. It was all funny games. Until the next day, when Bunk and Freeman got to work and come to find out, their boss was like, listen, y'all know he can't solve his way out of a brown paper bag. We got to clear these cases. Y'all are our best hope, so the cases belong to you now. So, you know, now they're ready to kill McNulty because then they ended up, Bunk and Freeman ended up getting getting stuck with those 13 dead bodies. Well, actually, four, 15 dead bodies, child. So the joke, the final joke was on them. And I'm sure there was a small part of that was to get back to McNulty because they all know that McNulty is cool with them. So I'm sure part of it was that, right? So now Stashi, who is Pres Belutsky's father-in-law, I got his name, I got his name. He still can't get over this whole window situation. So he ends up going down to go talk to one of his people down at um, one of his, you know, political buddies. And he was like, basically he went down there to see if he could make the priest give the give the window back and he was like i can't like a priest is not gonna give no money back he they made a donation they gave him the window they got there first like there's nothing you can do he was like i thought you had juice he was like listen city hall i got juice annapolis which is the capital of baltimore i got juice the pope i don't have no juice i can't make the priest do nothing he was like well how did he get all that money anyway he was like now that is a good question how does he have that kind of money? Because then they started having a conversation about the docs and how, you know, the docs really haven't been putting that kind of money out. How does the union, you know, how is the union keeping this much money? How do they have that kind of money? And now that is the bigger question. And on his way out of the office, he sees a prototype for this like high rise business called the grainy or something like that. One of those gentrification. We're going to start seeing some gentrification going on in this season too. So, Stashi ends up going down to um, 
come to find out Burrell is being tapped as the next um, chief of police. So Stashi caught himself going down there and letting Burrell know, listen, I can help you out. I can get you, you know, my constituency, which is basically the white Polish, you know, on my side of Baltimore. You know, I can get them behind you. And, you know, of course, Burrell smells bullshit. He was like, I appreciate your help that I didn't ask for, but um, what you want? Stashi wants a private detail to investigate the union. He was like, listen, all I need is, you know, a couple of th- couple of good men and I need a little bit of time. Give me about six weeks. I just need to investigate and see what's going on. Sound familiar? Does it sound familiar? Sound like last season? Hmm. And so Burrell ends up giving it to him. And who does he put as his point man over this little team that he got rolling? Press Belusky. Um, so that's where the union has started. So we see that going on with the union. They about to get into a whole shit match with um, Stashi. The union, um, he ends up getting, so one morning we see all the guys getting ready to go to work and they're at the bar that they always go to and they're drinking beer with shots. Like, I guess it's like their morning ritual of what they do to get themselves ready to go to work. Honey, no sooner do they come about that bar, who come, they come to the police pulling them over and end up getting them arrested. So they all end up getting DUIs. So as a result, um, the union ends up stealing one of their like top of the line police vans that's got like all the top of the line, the newest technology in it. Honey, why they put it on the crate and ship it off? Like they ain't just steal it. They stole it, put it on a crate and shipped it away. I said, oh, they are playing big. So again, the chess back and forth. But Stashi has actually got the checkmate because now he's got this private detail that's about to start investigating their money how they got so much money and what they got going on down to the dots, which of course, you know, going to end up putting them in the line of fire with the Greek, but we'll get there. Daniels has decided that he is, that, you know, he knows that he has basically ruined his career with the whole Barksdale thing. He has this law degree that he's sitting on. So he's going to end up leaving the police force and, you know, going to get a, you know, a, 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 a job at a local law firm. His wife tells him, she was like, listen, with your, experience, you know, with the police department, anybody, you know, any, you know, criminal firm would, would, would you know, um, sop you up. So he was like, yeah, you know, you right. I'm going to go put my papers in. Now, Ziggy, y'all remember Ziggy? Ziggy wants to be a drug dealer. He tries to get his cousin to go in with him to go pick up a package. His cousin is like, yeah, I'm not, no, we're not doing that. Like, he knows that he's not playing those games with him. So he ends up um, going to go get the package and the, the drug dealer is like, no, Ziggy, you didn't mess up the last two packages I gave you. I'm not giving you no more. He was like, come on, man. He was like, if you want to buy some weight, I'll let you buy some weight because that's on you. I ain't got nothing to do with that. But I can't, I'm not getting ready to do this with you. I'm not going to play them games with you. So we'll get back to that because Ziggy, Ziggy's a character, honey. Ziggy, I don't remember everything, but some of the stuff I remember, but I remember Ziggy's a character child. So, so the other thing we find out is a couple of little odds and ends. Um, McNulty is still messing around with Rhonda, but what we find out is that McNulty and his wife might be trying to make some things work out. And of course, Rhonda, you know, she was like, listen, what are we doing here, McNulty? You show up at my house drunk. Like, what's really going on? And McNulty, being the insensitive ass that he is, that's when he was like, well, you know, me and my wife are talking about trying to make things work. And so, of course, Wanda is like, you got to be kidding me. Like, really, dude? So, we got that going on. Um, D is not doing too well in jail, honey. D is getting high, okay? So, when, um, when Avon goes to check on D, D is getting high. And he's trying to hide it from Avon, but Avon ain't stupid. He sees what's going on, and so, you know, they're going to keep an eye on D. You know, things ain't looking too good for D, child. Things ain't looking too good for D. Um, and then we let's get back to the Greek. So the Greek is actually, we see the Greek. They don't know that they really, they see the Greek. They think the Greek is just some old man that's hanging out, you know, at the little spot. But they realize they're trying to figure out what happened with their cargo. They want to know how did the Greek... Um, why did that guy give them the signal that they were going to give them? So they drive up to Philly 
um, to go find the dude that they was that was supposed to give them the signal. And um, they end up chasing him down, child, because he 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 when the but when the boat wasn't leaving, he was like, okay, there's some shit going on. Like he was like, so may right the boat ain't because the boat was stuck in dock and nobody could tell him why. He was like, Mm-mm, nope, something ain't right. So he leaves the ship. And he tries to run. They chase him down. They beat his ass. They torture him. And so the Greek comes through, and the Greek was like, so listen. What's going on? What happened? And you know, the dude was like, I don't speak no English. The Greek was like, What you do? What do you speak? Because I probably speak what you speak. Just tell me what happened. You know, he's being all cool. He's like an older guy with a cane and everything. And he's playing like good cop, bad cop situation. And finally the dude ends up telling them what happened. You know, the dude says, Look, we were on the ship. You know, we let the women out, let them get some fresh air. We went to go hook up. One of the girls wasn't with it. The dude got rough with her, ended up and um, ended up killing her. So we had to throw her overboard. But I think it was one of the other girls. They heard, they saw what happened, and so basically the dude made the decision to let all of them die rather than have to do it with. One of them talking and telling about what happened to the one that got they died. So they ended up. I mean, that's the show version. I mean, it was a whole long scene, but that's the show version of it. So of course they ended up killing the dude. And basically he was like, "So you let my whole ship, like you let my whole cargo die, because of one, one one woman." I mean, of course they didn't say it as nice as that. So. You know, that's what happened. That's how the floater ended up in the water before the rest of them. And that's why the dude never gave the signal because they made a decision to just let everybody die rather than deal with the consequences of that one situation getting back to the Greek child. Um, so, you guys, that is pretty much episode two. A lot going on, y'all. A lot going on. Let me know what y'all think. Drop it in those comments. Peace.